Last week, I reviewed a new Prime Streamline network transport. This week, I'll take a look at the DAC NX preamp and the power amp. I'll even test a pair of these power amps in bridge mode, good for 330 watts each. More and more DACs are equipped with a circuit that offers digital input selection and volume control. Sometimes they even have analog inputs, like in this case. When combined with a power amp, like the class D amp I will also review here, only a source, like the Stream 9 I reviewed last week, and a pair of speakers is needed for a complete stereo. Let's see whether DAC 9X can be placed in your stereo. As said, a source is needed, like a network transport, a streamer without DAC, that is connected over the digital connection to the DAC 9X. Depending on the source, that can be a SPDIF, TOSLINK or USB cable, or an HDMI cable for the I2S connection. The network transport needs to be connected to your home network. Depending on your network transport, that can be over Wi-Fi or network cable. This way it can stream from the internet radio stations and services like Tidal, Cobus, Spotify, Amazon Music and the like. If you have music stored in your computer or NAS, that can be played too. The output of the preamp must be connected to a power amp, in essence an amplifier without controls and usually only one pair of inputs. The power amp is connected to a pair of loudspeakers. Primary functions like volume, input, Presets, play, pause and skip can be controlled using the infrared remote, but usually the network transport is controlled using a smartphone or tablet. But other digital sources like for instance a CD player or the audio of a TV can be connected too. A CD player will usually be connected over a SPDIF cable, while a TV can be connected over an optical toslink cable. A special input allows for a small new force network transport, while a computer can also be connected directly using a USB cable. The DAC 9X has the same cabinet as the Stream 9 I reviewed earlier, so it measures 235 by 281 by 60 mm. It weighs 2.5 kilos. On the front we see two rotary encoders. The one on the left lets you select inputs by turning while pressing puts it in or out of standby mode. Next to it the 6.3 mm headphone output. In the middle an infrared window and the LED display. In the queue of MQA is a small LED that indicates MQA decoding and rendering. A toggle switch lets you choose between fixed or variable output while the right rotary encoder lets you set volume by turning and mute by pressing. On the left we see the power switch next to the IEC mains inlet. A trigger output can switch on a power amp in standby when connected over a 3.5 mm jack cable. Below it a digital output on Toslink. The analog balanced outputs are available on XLR, while the single ended outputs are on RCA. There is one analog line level input that can be used for a tuner for instance. If you want to connect a turntable it has to have an internal or external phono preamp. The USB B input is for connecting a computer, smartphone or tablet, although these can also be connected over Bluetooth at the expense of some sound quality. The extension port is for a number of new prime low budget streamers, not for the Stream 9. Then there are two I2S inputs with a pinout according to the PS Audio de facto standard. These inputs are not suited for video related signals. A SPDIF and Toslink digital input complete the tour of the back. In contrast to the Stream 9, here the insight was fully needed for the electronics. Let's start with the mains filter. From there the power goes to the mains voltage selector. That can be set through the hole in the bottom to either 
115 or 230 volts. Then the AC power goes to the toroidal transformer that transforms it to a lower voltage. A row of diodes convert the AC into a rough DC that is smoothed and buffered by the electrolytic capacitors here. Four voltage regulators provide for stable DC voltages. Direct behind the headphones connector we find the headphones amplifier. A SYNCMOS microcontroller provides the display signals. The XMOS microcontroller here does the AES3 and USB interfacing. New Prime's own sampling converter brings the signal to the internally used frequency. The analog input is converted to digital by the series 5340C2280C. The digital signal is converted to analog using one ESS ES9028Q2M per channel. I presume they sum up the two outputs of one DAC chip to lower the noise and distortion. The outputs are then sent to these op amps and finally sent to these output stages. All Texas Instruments OPA 134s. Once connected, you have to choose between a fixed or variable output level. If you have a power amplifier connected directly to the DAC 9X, set it to variable and turn the volume knob counterclockwise. If you have it connected to an integrated amp or preamp, fixed is probably the best. Only when your amp or preamp wants lower signal voltage, you might select variable and turn back the volume a bit. The next step is to switch it on with the power switch on the back. After that press the left rotary encoder to switch it out of standby and turn it to select the desired input. The LED display shows which one is chosen with a two position code. C1 stands for coax aka SPDIF, O2 stands for optical aka toslink, U3 stands for USB, A5 for analog and so on. And that's all there is to it. The DAC 9X was connected to the Arkham Radia A25 amplifier that in turn was connected to a pair of Acoustic Energy Radiance 1 loudspeakers over Kimber 4PR loudspeaker cable. They were placed on 80's target loudspeaker stands on Stack Audio OVA 50 isolators. The lows are extended by a REL T5 subwoofer that is connected to the loudspeaker terminals on the Arkham using the cable that came with the sub. The digital source is the Eversolo DMP A6 Master Edition with B-Technic LPS A6 power supply. The network switch is the Optron Audio Ether Regen with Optron Audio Ultra Caps 1.2 power supply. I used an iPad Pro 2 with both Omni Receiver and Rune apps. The equipment was housed in an 80's target rack. The stereo image is royal, rather deep and wide with fair focus. The lows go deep and have a nice texture, while the mids and highs are what is to be expected in this price range. Good. Sibilance isn't loud but has a high Q and therefore more noticeable. Having said that, many low bit DACs in this price range perform less. Overall I rated DAC 9X 3 quarters up in my setup 2A. Dutch Instruments of DMAX provided me, on my request, with a complete new prime home stereo setup. The reason for two power amps is that they can be bridged. In bridge mode the two channels of one amp are summed up, resulting in a mono amp with about twice the power. As always with bridged amps you can't connect the high level input of a subwoofer to the speaker terminals on the amp as I am used to do for then you connect one output stage to ground. If you would like to connect your sub to the speaker outputs of a bridged amp, connect the subs plus to the plus of the speaker output terminal and connect the minus of the sub to an earth point on the amp, like a chassis. Alternatively you could connect the sub on line level to the preamp or subwoofer output on your amp. If in doubt, ask your dealer, for when done wrong the amp, any amp in bridge mode, will get damaged. Let's take a look at the amp. 
the SDA9X has the same dimensions as the other two components, meaning 235 by 281 by 60 mm. It weighs 4 kilos. The front has no controls, only a tiny blue LED to show the power is on. On the rear we see the IEC mains inlet with next to it the power switch. Then a trigger input and output which makes it possible to automatically switch on the amp or amps when the DAC 9X or a preamp is switched on. Then the outputs on loudspeaker terminals that accept fork, banana plug and bell wire. These are for the right channel and these for the left. The small switch lets you choose between the balanced XLR or unbalanced RCA inputs. The switch below lets you select between stereo or mono bridge mode. In stereo mode these are the balanced inputs and these are the single ended aka unbalanced inputs. In bridge mode these two terminals form the mono output while one of the right channel inputs are used. When opened we see the mains input with directly behind it the fuse and the mains filtering. From there it travels to the voltage selector and subsequently to the toroidal transformer where the high AC voltage is transformed to lower voltages. The conversion from AC to DC plus the buffering finds place here. Then we get to the audio part. Here the class A input circuits with local voltage regulators. They drive the self oscillating class D amps that deliver 2 times 130 watts into 8 ohms in stereo mode and 1 times 330 watts in 8 ohms when in bridge mode. The class D amp has a rather high switching frequency of 750 kHz. The audio bandwidth is 50 kHz. I have tested the STA9X in combination with the other equipment in this series. The DAC 9X connected over Siltec London RCA cable to the STA9X's and the Stream 9 connected to the DAC 9X over I2S with a 25 cm short 4K HDMI cable. This time I used the loudspeakers of my setup 1, the PMC FAC 12 signature loudspeakers on Stack Audio over 70 isolators and connected over AudioQuest Robinhood Zero loudspeaker cable. The network switch was the Zixel GS1900-10HP and was connected to the Stream 9 over a network acoustics Eno system network filter. Both also from my reference set 1B. The Rune Nucleus 1 takes care of Rune while the Synology DS119J ran Minim server as DNA server. It holds a 3 terabytes drive filled with music. I used an iPad Pro 2 with both Omni receiver and Rune apps. At the end I also listened to this setup with two STA9 power amps switched to bridge mode. Combining the three still results in a slightly bright sound. Again not sharp, bright. Add to that the very well controlled lows of the class D amp that had a firm grip on the big PMC transmission lines. Stereo imaging, mids and highs are good for a position halfway my setup too. The lows score a bit higher. Sibilance is rather well controlled for a setup based on a low bit converter. See the show notes for a link to my reference setups. When two power amps in bridge mode are used, the sound character stays the same but now there is even more control in the lows. New Prime sets itself apart by using a design and features that could not be found by many other manufacturers. But also by technical designs. Like, for instance, the sample rate converter chip they designed together with an Asian partner. And the relatively affordable and bridgeable power amps. Whether you need that depends on your loudspeakers. The only way to really decide on that is to try it with your speakers. With the PMCs I used, it would pay, but it is of course unlikely that this setup is going to be used with a 21K speaker. But then again, there are more affordable speakers that need more current than the average amp can supply. In those cases a solution as given here by New Prime is a fine one. To round it up I would say that the home stereo series offered good value 
both sound-wise and feature-wise. And on that bombshell we come to the end of this video. Next week at Friday 5 pm Central European time there will be a new video again. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on Patreon, Facebook, LinkedIn or Instagram so you will be informed when new videos are out. Help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumbs up or link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you next week. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.